The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, April 23rd, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live to tape steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown Brooklyn, USA. Yes, folks, it's another one of our famous vacation show, book show, interview, fresh content, even though we're not there, but you don't care because you listen by podcast anyways, except for those people who listen live, in which case it's okay, folks. We'll be back soon. On the program today, Evan Thomas journalist, author of First Story of Sandra Day O'Connor. Why is that relevant? Well, because the Supreme Court is important and uh, interesting to get insight into the Supreme Court from any portal possible. Sandra Day O'Connor's story, one such portal. She was rather disaffected with the way that the Supreme Court turned out. Some regret there, ladies and gentlemen. Who can blame her? Well, I blamed her. I, I guess I could. I blamed her, not so much for the regret, but for the things that she regretted. But we'll get into that with Evan Thomas. In the meantime, uh, I am on vacation with the kids. It is now the day three. And if I have done this properly, things are going great for me. I'm sitting by a pool in Florida. I've managed to dish off the kids. I'm just hanging out, having, you know, I don't know if I'm actually having a pina colada, but in my my mind's eye, I am. Maybe a, maybe some type of rum drink. I guess a pina colada. Forget it. Let's just stick with a pina colada. I'm enjoying myself and I'm probably, I don't know, answering emails. And going through uh, stuff that I haven't done for the majority report in a long time. That's my vacation. Getting drunk and, uh, you know, trying to fix the back end of the website. But I'll tell you, uh, if I'm not doing that, I know what I'm doing. Because one of today's sponsors is Skillshare. And anyone who goes to skl.sh, Majority Report 2, is going to get two whole months of totally free access to Skillshare's entire library of super quality online courses and tutorials. Skillshare is a vibrant online learning community that offers courses on everything. from design to video editing, photography, business, technology, cooking, meditation, everything in between. So I'm sitting there. I've got my pina colada. I'm watching a Skillshare video because there's courses for everyone. I'm going to have no problem finding a course that's going to be interesting to me, not just in my personal life, but also my business life, as will you. If you want to sharpen your skills with something you already love doing, or you want to learn something that is totally new, Skillshare has you covered. They have courses for entrepreneurs, courses on computer coding, web development, personal nutrition, learning new languages, Photoshop, you name it. Like I say, I'm sitting by the pool right now. I'm probably checking out um, how can I up my social media game? How can I keep uh, things neat around the house? It's not, that's not so easy for me. And the thing that I, uh, that every time I dip into Skillshare, the thing that I love is I end up looking at things that I I don't think are going to be relevant to me. I'm like, eh, it's sort of interesting. I wonder, and there's no, the bar to entry is so low. And I end up always having at least one thing that I take away that I use in my daily life in some fashion. 
Just think of everything you're going to have at your fingertips for two whole months. Again, that's skl.sh slash majority report two. Skillshare. I've put a link underneath this video if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening, I put a link in the description of the podcast. So check it out. <clears throat> also, as I sit and deal with my kids alone, my two kids, just me and them, the support that the majority report is getting from Simple Habit is also going to be helpful to me. Why? It's a mobile app that provides a massive and diverse library of five-minute guided meditations. And the majority report audience can try Simple Habit totally for free for an entire week when you go to simplehabit.com slash majority. Look, there's a lot of uh, hard science out there about the value of meditation. Anecdotally, half the people in this office will tell you that meditation is their saving grace. Simple Habit has over 2,000 guided meditations specifically designed for different parts of your day and just about anything you might be dealing with in life. They've guided meditations for mindfulness, med uh, meditations for anxiety, for depression, when you're having trouble falling asleep, meditations for when you're wanting to overcome procrastination, uh, or if you got something that's particularly stressful at work or something that you want to be clear-eyed and um, bring your A game to. They got meditations designed for parents who are losing their minds on a trip with their kids. Maybe not specifically losing their minds with a trip with the kids, but basically. What I like about Simple Habit is that I can go in. It's another one of those things where the bar to entry is just so low and I can try meditation and I can do, I can find one that's completely appropriate for me in that moment. I'm not a big, uh, I'm not big into meditation and Simple Habit allows me to dip in, dip out. I love it. Different people are trying to accomplish different things with meditation. Simple habit can cater to just about everyone. Doesn't matter what your goals are. Doesn't matter how much past experience, like I said, with meditation. The variety of guided meditations on Simple Habit is what sets it apart. It just won the 2018 Google Play Award for Best Well-Being App. You can get it for iOS, Android, and your web browser. Majority Report audiences can try it for a week by going to simplehabit.com slash majority. Simplehabit.com slash majority. If you're watching on YouTube, put the links in the, um, in the, uh, the description and same with the podcast. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking to Evan Thomas on uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, his book. First, Sandra Day O'Connor. We'll be right back. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Evan Thomas, author of 10 books, former professor of journalism at uh, Princeton University. And his last book is first, Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, this, of course, is a uh, authorized biography of uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, the uh, first uh, woman to serve on the Supreme Court. Uh, Evan, welcome to the program. Hi, Sam. I have to correct you, it's not authorized. Oh, it is I not. I com complete access to the family, but authorized suggests that they have some control over it, and they don't. All right, my my, uh, my bad on that, and I appreciate the, the, the correction. And you did get extraordinary access. What what do you think, I mean, uh, I mean, you've written uh, multiple books. Um, what, what do you think um, was behind the access? They wanted, I mean, she definitely wanted to have a biography of her done, uh, and I'm a Random House author, and I, I'm a Random House author who has a law degree, so, uh, and they checked me out, you know, with other historians, um, but, you know, it's just, a, it's, it's, you know, she cares about her legacy. She, uh, there was some thought about her doing her memoir. She never got around to doing that, and I, I don't know why, but, uh, Part of it, I think, is that she, I don't think, was totally comfortable with being as forthcoming as you'd have to be if you were going to do a good memoir. Right. I mean, I guess what I'm getting to is this like, notion. I mean, I'm fascinated by the Supreme Court. And uh, in particular, I'm, I'm fascinated by, um, uh, you know, what happened in, in, uh, in 2000. Uh, and, and we will get there as well. 
Uh, but I, I, I mean, broadly speaking, before we, we talk about her life, what, I mean, the import of legacy to a Supreme Court justice. I mean, uh, talk about that to the extent that you can have gleaned uh, from what you've written, uh, because, uh, you know, we're, we're, entering, we're entering an era where it's conceivable uh, the majority on this court will have almost like a, a super majority um, over the next two years. We don't know, but and certainly a, a very durable major, majority when we look at the ages of, of, of the five uh, short of, of Thomas. What, what, where does legacy come in, do you think, or is it, is it, 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 can you make that generalization about different justices? Oh, sure. They all care about their legacy. I mean, they may say they don't, but of course they do. Um, you, you don't get to be a Supreme Court justice unless you care about your legacy. It's a, it takes some ego to get there. In her case, uh, it's a little complicated because she's not purely ideological. In fact, she's really quite the opposite. Uh, she didn't really like ideology, at least she didn't like I ideology and opinions. Uh, she was a pragmatist, a practical type, middle of the rotor. You know, she's the one who preserved abortion rights. That was her. And it was also Justice O'Connor who preserved affirmative action. But in, in both cases, she personally, I don't think, would have had an abortion. She had some reservations about abort abortion. And then uh, same thing with affirmative action. I think she had her her doubts about affirmative action, but she felt that it was important for the country and for the people in the country to have ab abortion rights, for women to have abortion rights limited to some degree by the state, to some degree, but to preserve Roe v. Wade. And on affirmative action, she doesn't love identity politics, and she wants affirmative action to end it, to not be necessary at some point, but she thinks that the country... Basically, although they may not like quotas, they do uh, want to have racial preference in areas like higher education, where, you know, it's, her view was law schools train leaders, I think a quarter of the U.S. Senate, they're, they're lawyers, and if you just did it on the numbers and you didn't have any affirmative action, you would the number of African Americans would drop way off to very, very low numbers. That, that actually happened in the West Coast when uh, California, when they uh, had a referendum about affirmative action. And she was influenced by the military and in business where, you know, the, you, you, you needed to have some affirmative action to make the numbers look like America. So the point here is that she's not particularly ideological about this. She's practical-minded. She's sensitive to where the country is. She's sensitive to this idea that the court can't get either too far behind or too far ahead, public opinion, without – you know, she doesn't read, she's not reading polls, but she's not unmindful of public opinion. Well, now, as you described, you know, these two um, uh, cases where uh, she ended up being the fifth vote in terms of uh, protecting abortion rights and uh, protecting uh, affirmative action. Um, the, there's no um, we, we're not mentioning any type of legal principles. I mean, uh, just to the extent that, you know, uh, I mean, as a lawyer, I mean, and, you know, and I think. Uh, I am certainly of the mind that um, the Supreme Court, that, you know, the legal principles sort of are, you know, very often uh, backfilling for um, for Supreme Court justices. But but speak to that, because, I mean, the sure. I mean, she she was not a doctrinaire uh, a conservative nor a doctrinaire liberal. But she certainly was a principal pragmatist. I mean, if you want to get into legal jargon here, you know, she Please. believed in, uh, uh, you know, strict scrutiny where, where there where there was racial preference that it should be exposed to strict scrutiny. But unlike some people, she didn't believe that strict scrutiny was fatal. In fact, she was willing to have exceptions for it. She was, you know, things could like, for instance, the need to have diversity in a, in a, on a college campus that would overcome the close scrutiny that the courts would give to racial preference. So that is that is principled, uh, but it's not the absolutist kind of principle that you would find on the right where they believe that any racial preference, where the Constitution is colorblind and all racial preference is bad, or on the left where they're pretty much pro-affirmative action no matter what. 
she's a middle of the roader. She's a compromiser. She because she was on both sides of this issue. It's not unprincipled, but it is practical. All right, so let's go back and 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 talk about you know how she ended up on the uh, Supreme Court, and I'm you know particularly fascinated about uh, the um, what she did in terms of like sort of I guess um, I mean socializing feels like too uh, too too soft of a, of a of a term. I mean she 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 changed it seems to me the the nature of the way that justices related to each other or were expected to relate to each other. She tried. I mean, when she got to the court, she found it was pretty cold. Uh, chilly was, I think, the word that she used. And, and, and the, uh, you know, it's, a, it's not just a marble building, but the justices didn't get along with each other. This is 1981, and your listeners, at least the older ones, will remember a book called The Brethren by Bob Woodward and Scott Armstrong. And that was an expose of the court. It came out in late 1979. And when O'Connor gets there about a year later, the justices don't trust each other. They're wondering who the leaker is. So she goes to her first lunch. They have a weekly lunch, sometimes more than once a week, but a weekly lunch. And only four other justices show up. And she's wondering, you know, where is everybody? And uh, she made it her business to get everybody to come to lunch. She would literally sit in their chambers until they came. My, my, uh, I was talking to Justice Thomas about this, and he's, he's very, this is a story is very illustrative of Justice O'Connor's style. Uh, I, you know, everybody remembers Thomas's hearings, Anita Hill, and I, without knowing this for sure, the, the strong impression I got from the clerks is that Justice O'Connor really did not like those hearings one bit, uh, both the nature of the allegations, sexual harassment, and just the whole spectacle of the whole thing. Well, what but, is that? Uh, wait, what is that? I want to. I'm sorry. I, I want to just press. Like, what? Um, I understand the notion of like feeling uncomfortable with the spectacle. But what was her perspective of like, uh, like the, the the nature of the hearings? Like that shouldn't have come up, or that, or or. No, I, I, the answer is I don't know. She didn't talk about it. But I'm I'm going to tell you what I what I do know. Okay. Uh, because her clerks, of course, were <laughs> very eager to know what she thought. She was grimly silent about the whole thing. Okay. From knowing a lot about her, I have a strong guess that she was very uncomfortable with the allegations themselves, whether or not they were true, but very uncomfortable, and the spectacle of a Supreme Court justice nominee going through that. You know, it was just a rough scene for the for the court. In any, let me so let me tell you the story. This Please. comes from Justice Thomas. He said, he told me, I, I was feeling hammered and lonely and alone. And so on the very first day, he's walking back from the court's conference to his chambers, and she walks with him, and she says, those hearings did a lot of damage. And he doesn't know what to say. I mean, is this about damage to me personally, damage to the court? She doesn't say anything, and he doesn't say anything. But the next day, and she doesn't look too happy. The next day, she walks with him again, and she says, Clarence, you got to come to lunch. And the next day, Clarence, you got to come to lunch. And finally, she says, Clarence, you got to come to lunch. And he, you know, so he had been sulking, basically, in his tent, and he came to lunch, and he said it changed things for him. And the point here is that the justices don't have to love each other, but they do have to work together. Uh, they don't always work together, but it's better if they do. And uh, O'Connor had this effect of making people come together. Again, it's not, you know, it doesn't have to be jolly friendship, but you just, it, it helps if you break bread together. You're more likely to, to be able to work stuff out. And, and, and O'Connor believed, not always in compromise, but sometimes, I mean, actually, sometimes she was would go off on her own uh, um you know, separate opinion, concurrence of concurring opinion, and drive other justices crazy. So she wasn't always on the team, but at times she was, and 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 she at times, like more famously Justice Brennan, she would bring five together. But she wanted people to work together, and and to when they needed to to compromise, whether she approved of them personally or not. And 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 but for Thomas, right? No one uh, is sitting on the Supreme Court that sat with O'Connor. Is that right at this point, or no? Uh, well, no, I guess no, Ginsburg Breyer, and Breyer, Ginsburg. right? Okay. No, no, there are a bunch of right, right, yeah, of course. No, no. 
um, uh, uh, I guess that she they uh, they were at the I, I guess uh, maybe they had just come in under under Clinton. Um, and so this notion, I mean, how much did she uh, did you get a sense of of horse trading? I mean, I'm curious as to uh, to what extent once you start to build those those bridges and she has this sort of uh, practicality where she is very conscious of. I mean, it seems to me that she has a, a consciousness of her role as sort of like a, a an uber politician or statesperson, if you will, in measuring where the um, the country is at that point and not, you know, uh, based upon her ideology to some extent. Like wh- how much uh, like horse trading would she do? Was she in a position where zero, she would- zero horse trading is the wrong word to use for these people. There's a subtle, uh, you know, so there is some small p politics. Of they will they will they will tr- they will narrow their they'll alter their uh, when, when they're writing an opinion you can see some back and forth where they try to accommodate each other but the idea that they log roll or horse trade I, that's just not I mean I spent a lot of time in sitting in those files I used to cover Congress there's a difference between horse trading and what they do there there are some subtle modifications in order to get majority opinions. And there are some times when it looks pretty crude. I'm, I know we're going to get to Bush v. Gore, and that's a place where it got really crude. But uh, generally speaking, it's fairly high-minded. And they are careful about, you know, they're careful about principle. They're careful about precedent. They're careful not to look too naked and raw about this. I mean, how do because, I, you know, there's a, there's a new book out about, and, you know, I know this is sort of outside of your portfolio, uh, but there's a new book out about uh, John Roberts. And, um, you know, and I haven't, uh, to be fair, I haven't read the book and I've read just um, uh, maybe a, a secondhand account of it. But it appears that uh, in the context of the Affordable Care Act, that there may have been some of that or at least uh, there they've, you know, between uh, Roberts and uh, Kagan and Breyer, there was at least a um, some type of equilibrium found. Um, yeah, that's different from horse trading. Suggests right. you're tr- swapping, you're trading. I just object to the word because it, because it, it suggests quid pro quo. I'll right. give you this if you give me that. I don't. I know it doesn't work that way. That that, that doesn't mean that there aren't politics and they're not talking to each other and they don't have agendas that are not purely, say, shall we say, uh, judicial. Uh, but horse trading is a harsh word uh, for, a, for a more subtle process. All right, I don't want to get caught up on the semantics, but I, I'm, I am curious on how that dynamic works because it's just um, it, it's fascinating. It is, and, and, but I'm, I'm, what I'm saying to you, it's subtle. It's not like in the legislature you say, if you vote for my bill, I'll vote for yours. Right. I'll trade you a sewer culvert for a post office. It's just not that way on the court. It just isn't. It's much more subtle. Now, that's not to say they don't have political beliefs and that they don't trim their sails a little bit, but it's a much more subtle process. And is there uh, and so there is never a sense of like, um, you know, uh, if we if, if, if we come to agreement on this uh, principle here, this is going to uh, intellectually obligate you uh, to do why in the future. Nothing. There's no or, or is that no. just the hypothetical conversations no, like that? No, no. Nothing no, like it. no, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, I spent a lot of time reading their memos and talking to them, and it's they they are conscious about not doing that. They they would have you believe it's not political at all. Now, of course, it is because look at the look at the outcomes. You know, right? You often have liberals on one side and conservatives on the other. So yes, it's political. But the process itself is they. If you look at their memos, they are talking about points of law with each other. And the argument is always uh, logical and rational, and it's just never a crude trade. It just isn't. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm still, you know, trying to, and maybe it's one of those things where you, you need to be involved in a dynamic to get a real sense of it. But I mean, as we were just talking about affirmative action and abortion, you know, all of uh, the assessments that you um, attribute to uh, Sandra Day O'Connor were, uh, in many respects. You know, uh, political assessments about where the public is and, and what would work and, and sort of a sense of decency and, you know, um, uh, the that, that's it's not it's not purely. Let's do abortion here. Uh, she, when she comes on the court, 
uh, is, is, you know, Roe v. Wade is the precedent, right. and that's uh, that's a three trimester system. Uh, without getting too far into the weeds here, you know, in the first trimester, the woman has an absolute right to uh, abort her fetus, and the second trimester, the state consider the health of the woman, and the, the third, the state has, you know, more interest. And she decides that that's basically not practical because viability of a fetus is is, is lengthening. And so the trimester system is, as she put it, on a collision course with itself. So she's looking for a new rationale. She still wants to uphold abortion rights. She does believe, you know, she's willing to believe that in the 14th Amendment, the Due Process Clause, there is a privacy right for a woman. Uh, but she, the question is, does this, when does the state get in there? And she comes up with a different standard called undue burden, meaning the state cannot put an undue burden on a woman's right to an abortion. Well, what does undue, bur- undue burden really mean? Well, that's kind of a case-by-case thing. So, you know, does it mean you have to notify your parents, the woman, does she have? Does a doctor have to read something to her about? You know, there are various things that states do. How far can and you drive, how for far, instance? Right. Uh, how hard is it for you to exercise this right? And uh, yeah. exactly, yeah, all that. And that's sort of a case by case thing. That's infuriating to the purists, of course. But she is recognizing that the states have some interest here, and it's going to be decided case by case. She was very much a case by case person. It's exhausting because of the abortion, you know, they keep having to do this every couple of years. And uh, so there are a lot of critics of that. But that was the way she was, kind of a pragmatic case-by-case person. Let's inch this along. And I do think, although she didn't read polls, she was aware that about a third of the country is against abortion under any circumstances, and about a third is for it under any circumstances. But... And then there's a third that's, you know, in between. And she thinks, thought, that the court should be mindful of that public opinion, if you will, uh, and not go too far one way or the other. She's not sitting there looking at, you know, like a politician looking at what Gallup told her last night, but she's not unmindful of public opinion. And um, if I... um, uh uh, recall, she was um, a she was a um, a politician in Arizona, um, yep. and upon I mean, she, she, had she sat as a judge in any on any level uh, prior to the Supreme Court? Yeah, yeah, she was a she was a trial court. She first she was a politician. You're right. In fact, she's the last Supreme Court justice to have actually had to ask for votes. She was in the state legislature. Amazingly, she was the first woman ever to be the Senate, a majority leader of a state Senate anywhere. She then went on, became a trial court judge, did that for a few years, then on the state court of appeals judge. That's a court, state court of appeals. It's an intermediate thing. She's not on the state Supreme Court. So it was a big uh, reach for her to get on the U.S. Supreme Court. You know, she's not even dealing with constitutional issues, not U.S. constitutional issues. Right. She was not even in the judge. federal court system at that point. Right. She was basically not not prepared to be a U.S. Supreme Court justice, as we would measure that today. Yeah, and I, I mean, I asked that because um, you know, because uh, and that's what I had recalled was that her her judicial experience was not uh, within the federal system, and that right. idea of doing uh, case by case is um, it makes more sense in the context of a state court, right, where you're not creating broad principles that are to apply to essentially, you know, 300 million people. That's true, but she was also wary, leaving aside the distinction between state and federal, she was wary that when judges, when federal judges apply broad principles, they create unintended consequences. That the, the, and also she noticed that she, one of the games up there is that justices will try to salt into their opinion some dicta that uh, becomes the basis for later uh, opinions by lower court judges. Uh, Luke Brennan was famous for this, of kind of salt into his footnotes and, and, and side, uh, remarks on the side that he knew lower court judges, uh, you know, balls that they would pick up with and run to basically broaden the expanse of, of federal power. And she was always trying to step on those uh, little uh, uh, land, uh, st- stomp out those little nuggets that he would salt in there. So she was very sensitive to the court's 
language having more meaning than, than the court necessarily intended, or at least more meaning than she intended. She liked to limit, limit the reach of these opinions. Now, the criticism of that is that it doesn't give very good guidance to the courts below, and you're constantly having to relitigate things. I have a friend who's a federal judge who was cranky about this. He said, how do we know what to do if you don't tell us? Right. And so that, that, is, that, is, a, that is a valid criticism of, of hers. She would say, well, I just don't want to get ahead of ourselves. And, you know, she had this, if you want to talk about philosophy here, this is, this is actually important. Her view of the court was not as the last word. Rather, it was, some, it was an institution that was engaged in an ongoing conversation with other institutions, with state legislatures, and lower courts, and state courts, and federal courts, part of this ongoing conversation that was going to very slowly work out the hard issues that, that you struggle with, affirmative action and abortion being, being two of them, where public opinion is divided. And it's really hard to know you know, in affirmative action, one of the great existential questions, can you use race to remedy the problems of racism? I mean, it's a fantastically difficult existential question, you know, using race to cure race. And some people just say, absolutely not. And other people say, well, of course. I mean, if you're Thurgood Marshall, yes, of course, you have to do this. But if you're, you know, William Rehnquist, no. Uh, and she was in the middle on that. All right, let's talk about um, uh, 2000. Um, I, I'm, I, you know, have spent the better part of my adult life um, uh, considering that election to be a, um, a real uh, problem, and I feel like we could probably draw a lot of, uh, of today's ills in our country to that, uh, the way that election was uh, handled. And my understanding is that she, at the very least, had some regrets about it. Uh, talk about her uh, role in the Bush v. Gore decision, I think a lot of people who are listening to the to the program don't really um, uh, understand exactly, you know, like how it got to the Supreme Court. It was extremely messy way in which it got to the Supreme Court. Uh, just uh, give us a thumbnail on that, and then her sure. role in those. Sure. I mean, you know, I'm sure your listeners will remember in Florida, there were all these different ways to vote there. And there were hanging chads and undervotes and overvotes. And it was just a mess. And uh, so it got, a, it got into the court system to try to resolve this. And the basic question was, do you have to have a, a system by which all the votes are counted the same way? And uh, that's why it be really became an issue for a, an equal protection issue, if you will, for, for the U.S. Supreme Court. But it's really complicated because the, the, the question of whether the Supreme Court should be involved at all in what is essentially a – well, it's a state court. State legislatures decide – state legislatures decide how you choose electors right. Right, from the popular vote. But it's a federal election, so the Supreme Court – although the Supreme Court likes to stay out of local political stuff. In this case, since it's electing a president, that, that is a, a, a federal question, and so they involve themselves. But it's, but it's a difficult question, and uh, they, they can't I mean, at the time, is it, is it fair to say, because this was, my, um, this was my sense at the time, was that the vast majority of legal scholars— thought that once it was in the Florida Supreme Court, that the, that the Supreme Court of the United States would not touch this case, that they would just simply reject, uh, they would just not grant it cert, as it were, right? I mean, w do you think that's a fair— I'm not, sure the vast, I'm not sure the vast numbers would. Certainly all the liberals would. Well, but— uh, uh, Because but that, 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 that produced a better outcome. Well, I understand, but, 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 but I mean, forget vast. W do you think the majority of legal scholars at that time— uh, were surprised that the Supreme Court picked it. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I do. And I think that I probably would have been on the other side of this, but but you asked me about Justice O'Connor's thinking, so right. let, let me try to talk about that. She, again, on her pragmatic notion, you got to follow the bouncing ball here. This gets a little complicated, but but, but let me... I, I have to explain this, because otherwise you can't understand her. Yeah, I, and I, got this, I got this from Justice Ginsburg, who was my principal source on this, and a, a couple of anonymous sources. She was looking at the statute book, and there is actually a, or is a statute that applies to all this. So you have this case that comes up, and the issue is, do we allow the recount to go on? Do we allow the recount of votes to go on? 
Now, if the if the answer to that is yes, she thought there was a chance that Gore would win. You already had the Florida Secretary of State had already certified the Republican Secretary of State had already certified Catherine electors Harris. Or Harris had already certified electors for Bush. So the outcome could be this: that there's a certified bunch of electors, Republican. Gore wins, so now you're going to have two sets of electors, a Democrat and a Republican. Believe it or not, there's a rule book for this. It's uh, 3 U.S.C. 15. What happens is it goes to Congress, and the House has one vote, and the Senate has one vote. The House was going to be Republican. The Senate was going to be Democrat. So it would be a tie. Under the statute book, the tie is broken by, drum roll, the governor of the state, whose last name was Bush. Right. So it was going to be Jeb Bush deciding the presidency, giving it to his brother, no doubt. And she just didn't want to have that. That was going to be a car wreck. It was going to make us look like a banana republic. So her view was, look, let's get this over with. Let's get this done and, and go with the Republican view of electors. She, as you said, she had some regrets about this. Public, very unusual for her, extremely unusual for her. She told the Chicago Tribune about four years later, maybe we should have not have taken that case. But at the time, she was she was trying to forestall what she saw as a political train wreck that was going to elect Bush anyways. She she later comforted herself that the media did a recount. You may recall over the next year, yes. And Bush actually Bush actually did win, uh, unless you count all the overvotes and all the undervotes, which wasn't going to happen. Bush was going to win anyway. She tried to comfort herself with this, but it wasn't very comforting because she knew that she woke up on the morning that the vote, uh, the, the vote, the morning that the case came down in December, and that December of 2000, and she told her younger son, her middle son, that half the country is going to hate me. And she knew that. I mean, it was going to be bad for the court. It did hurt the court's standing for a while, although actually, if you look at Gallup, the court's standing recovered. But it still sticks in the craw of a lot of people. I, and I, I, you know, I constantly run into people who still want to kill her for that being the fifth vote on that. And we should say and, there was also, I mean, b- built into the decision was essentially um, almost a, a like a, a caveat you don't see in, in many decisions. Like this is a one off. And um, the, the the reasoning here is not applicable to any future case, essentially. Uh, ugly. It was ugly. I mean, it's just ugly because they're doing an equal protection argument here. But it's just for one case, one time only. It was, uh, I don't know, if, am I allowed to swear on your show? Sure. I certainly have sworn about this many, many times. Okay. So Scalia, who's in the majority, said the reasoning was, was as we say in Brooklyn, a piece of shit. Right. And so, yes, it was. And, and being in Brooklyn, I would agree with those sentiments. And so, uh, let, so the, then let me ask you about this, because you mentioned like uh, the, the Supreme Court rebounded in terms of like uh, uh, popular opinion. Uh, and I'm not convinced that, frankly, 9-11 wasn't in some way, um, it, it, that wasn't a function of the country sort of like a turning away from that decision. Because my understanding is, um, and because, like I say, I was a little bit obsessed with this, that on September 13th of 2001, there was going to be a, a uh, the cover of Newsweek was going to be dedicated to the fracture on the Supreme Court in the wake of that decision. And that it was centered around a, uh, a meeting that the uh, some of the justices had with, I think, uh, justices from Russia, coincidentally, um, who were sort of mocking the Supreme Court for picking uh, the president. Did you come across any of that in the course of your research? I, I, work, I work for Newsweek. There was nothing. There was no cover saying that. I don't know where, who you're talking to, but that's nonsense. Oh, really? On, uh, I, in I, September? I, I, was, of... I, I was assistant managing editor of Newsweek then. So there was no story about the uh, the Supreme no. Court. Oh, that's fascinating because I've been no. living with that. That I guess that that. I I I I, I was assistant managing editor of Newsweek. So was <laughs> there was there a uh, was there any type of uh, you know uh, fracture on the court in the wake of that? There were some hard feelings. 
Uh, I don't know how hard they were, but there was there was there was some tension. That's not the first time there's been tension on the court, to put it mildly. Uh, and the, certainly the clerks now. This is always an important distinction. What the clerks think and what the justices think are not always the same thing. The clerks, there was real anger and real upset among the law clerks over this. The justices, yeah, I mean, I know I talked to Justice Stevens, and I said, this is interesting, actually. This, uh, I, I said to Justice Stevens about this, you know, Justice O'Connor has some regrets about Bush v. Gore, and Justice Stevens said she doesn't have enough. Hmm. He was still pissed. How many, how many years later is this? 18 years later? He was still upset about it. So, yeah, there were some bad feelings. But it's it's not the first time there's been bad feelings among the justices. And I think most of the discord you're hearing, I'm guessing, came from the clerks. Huh, interesting. Um, that is interesting. I mean, I, I guess I'm, uh, I, I had heard that story, and I'm still not convinced. I mean, that's fascinating about the... Um, uh, the uh, the Newsweek story because I'm actually I just I googled it because I've been living with this sort of I guess what is now I guess an apocryphy. Uh, there was a story by David Kaplan. I, I know that I don't know a lot of things for sure, but I know that for sure. There was a story by David Kaplan uh, in News. No, to David Kaplan, just not true. Well, I mean, not going to be a cover story for for Newsweek. Not okay. I mean, I I, I guess maybe I I misinterpreted it, but um, it was it was this. The story about the accidental president on uh, on, on September 16th. Uh, I mean, I'm just uh, I just googled it now. Maybe I'm wrong, um, and, and I would imagine definitely I'm wrong if you were the uh, the one of the managing editors. Um, and so that and that never broke out or any. It, it was um, that the that tension was. Um, well, there was. Ten- I'm not saying there wasn't some tension. I'm just saying that there have been lots of periods. You know, they used to call them scorpions in a bottle. I mean, you, you read Supreme Court history. There have been fantastic tensions. I don't think this was particularly worse than at other times. And when we were talking earlier, when Justice O'Connor came on the court in 81, there was a lot of tension over the brethren. Uh, and, and, you know, they don't they don't all get along. They don't. Uh, in fact, there are some pretty, you know, cold, uh, cold feelings. I just don't think that this tore up the court on any, in, any on any massive level, I, I I mean I know that Justice Stevens is still upset about it. Uh, I you know I talked to Justice Ginsburg about it. She wasn't she wasn't happy. She wrote a pretty strong dissent. There there were there were strong feelings. They don't the court had to do something in two days. They don't they certainly don't like doing that. This was not a good moment for the Supreme Court. I'm, I'm not suggesting that. It's just the idea that the court was torn apart in some fundamental way. I just I just don't think that's true. Interesting. And um, and so uh, in the final analysis, I mean, uh, we find out that um, Sandra Day O'Connor, who had left the court really basically to spend time with her husband, who was um, whose whose health, I guess, uh, was deteriorating rapidly. Um, she ends up regretting that decision. She does. Uh, I mean, there's a tr- tragedy. She left the Supreme Court to take care of her husband who had Alzheimer's. But within six months, he could barely recognize her. And so, it, and he was in a home. So she said, this is the dumbest thing I ever did. She, she, she regretted having left. She, the reason she did it was a, you know, a human one, but as it happened, he, he, he deteriorated and she couldn't, you know, he ended up having a, what they call a mistaken attachment, another girlfriend, a girlfriend in the home. And he'd be sitting there holding hands with, this woman, whose name was Kay, and, and Justice O'Connor would come in and sit down and hold her, his other hand. It was brutal for her. I mean, mm-hmm. publicly she said she was happy for him because he wasn't depressed anymore. But, you know, privately it was heartbreaking. Wow. Well, the book is first. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, Evan Thomas, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Good to talk to you. Good to Take talk care. to you. to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm going to get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are going to kick in And my pilot Choice was made.
I lost my drive 